It looks like it's about noon, so I think we're ready to get started. I know, our keynote speaker has the microphone all set up, so I'm the person without the microphone, but I will introduce our speaker. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to welcome you all for coming. It's really great to see people supporting our brown bag uh, lecture series. I am Linda Vanningen. I'm chair of the history department. And um, some of you I know are teachers or were teachers or retired professors. And I just want to let you know it's the last week of classes right now. So <laughs> things are a little crazy. We've been pushed and pulled in many directions. Um, one thing right before I came here, a student wanted to have a Zoom meeting with me. He's one of our online students in Lincoln. And I thought, you know, in the old days, we would check a voicemail and see if anybody's <laughs> called. And now nobody ever calls. <laughs> and so we check our email, and that's where all our student interactions are, email, unless they come to your office. Lots of email. Um, and then some of these emails are like, um, can we have a quick Zoom meeting session? I want to go over my summer class and, you know, my graduation plans. And I thought, you know, I can squeeze that in the 10 minutes that I have. <laughs> and so we sent him a Zoom link and everything, and we connected, and we had a, a brief conversation. And, it just uh, reminded me how things have changed and how they keep changing, you know, because it's a lot of clicks and email sends and such to even get the whole connection instead of just checking the voicemail, you know, it's a lot, lot different. But anyway, we're all here and um, my colleague is here to uh, present his talk on Willa Cather. But first of all, we want to definitely thank the Kearney Public Library for your support and for our co-sponsorship of this Brown Bag series. It's been really productive and it's been very uh, very nice to hear from people uh, supporting our work to bring these brown bag sessions to you. So I do, we do appreciate hearing from you. We really appreciate that. Um, so we have another talk coming up. We usually have these on the second Wednesday of the month. And our next one will be Professor Lorinda Weiss, Weissy. She is the uh, uh, archivist at the library on campus at UNK, the Calvin T. Ryan Library. Um, and she'll be presenting Extinct Education, Nebraska's Rural School Past. So as an archivist, she has access to all kinds of records of the um, rural education. So that'll be next month, second Wednesday of next month. So our speaker today will be uh, presenting his talk on Willa Cather's Kearney. Um, it's Dr. Nathan Tai. He is the Assistant Professor of Nebraska History in our department as well as the American West. And he's been with us uh, since 2019. He received his PhD from the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. And uh, his research area focuses on lives of migrant workers in the early 20th century. So in those days, they were known as hobos. So he does hobo research. Um, he also serves on boards of several local community museums and cultural organizations. And his research is published in Nebraska History, the Annals of Iowa, the Willa Cather Review, and he has appeared on NBC's Celebrity Genealogy Program. Do you guys know this program? Mm -hmm. Who do you think you are? Has anybody seen that? Yeah, okay, go back and you can find Dr. Ty on there. Yeah, you saw him, right? So we have a celebrity in our midst here, so I'm happy to welcome Dr. Ty to be our speaker here. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Good. Okay. Thank you, Linda, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, again, always thanks to the Carney Public Library uh, for, for sponsoring these. If you don't know, I'm also the organizer for, for the talks. Um, so it's really helpful to have a partner who is, is incredibly supportive and, and flexible in, in doing everything we do. Um, I also want to thank the National Willow Cather Center, the Buffalo County Historical Society, as well as the UNK Archives, who provided um, many of the materials that we're going to be seeing today, supported my research. And, and there'll be a little addendum at the end. I also did bring Cather material. So we've got some letters, a book from the library, other things. And then Lori Potter very generously brought um, a replica of the statue of Willa Cather that's going to be going in the US Capitol uh, very, very soon. So we have, we have other things too. Um, so we have, we have Willa with us today in a way. Um, but before I actually begin the talk, um, I want to just kind of, you know, make a comment that, that is going to be seen throughout. 
throughout this conversation is, is even if you don't know it, Will is everywhere around here. Um, so when you walked in, and those of you who have taken Ch uh, Chuck Peake's uh, senior college class, don't don't spoil this. Um, the the paintings in in the hallway when you came in are are Grant Renards. He's a he's a watercolorist and a uh, illustrator from Grand Island, and and has these wonderful scenes of, of Nebraska life. Okay, and, and early in his career, he'd been doing Saturday evening post covers and, and, and book illustrations and other things and was just feeling uh, less, he, he was kind of in a rut. And he goes to an artist's retreat where he's, you know, a, a, a young man from Grand Island making his way back east, where he meets a, a slightly older woman from Red Club. And this woman tells him, well, paint what you know. That's what I do. And he redirected his art to do Nebraska. And so because of Willa, we have those paintings in the hall. Um, also in, in the room directly facing, if you haven't seen, there's a beautiful Paul Swan. Um, Paul Swan is, is, is an incredible artist, dancer, um, sculptor, and, and, and kind of Renaissance man, the most beautiful man in the world. Um, and he's from, from Crab Apple, Nebraska. He's, he's still there now, he's in a coffee can between his parents, but um, <laughs> I'm not kidding. But, he uh, uh, did the bust of Willa Cather that is in the, the state capitol for the Nebraska Hall of Fame um, and, and when she went into the, to the state hall of fame. And so I, I, as far as I know, they never actually met or crossed paths. They didn't quite move in the same artistic circles, um, but, but also another connection to Willa in, in our immediate presence. Um, but, but, but also before we begin, as any good professor, I do have to ask how many, if, you, if you've done the reading, how many of you have read a Willa Cather Poem, novel, anything. O Pioneers, My Ancinia, My Mortal Enemy, Song of the Lark. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're, yeah, there's, there's, well, at least you've got a taste of, of who and what Willow was. And maybe one of ours, maybe some of her poems, you know. Um, and so that, that will, thank you, that will help shape the conversation that we're going to have today. And, and as we know, you know, she is our most. Um, and I know there's some Sandals people in the audience, so I'm, I'm sorry, but she is our most well-known and regarded writer. Um, that's, you know, this is the perpetual debate between the Sandals and the Cather people, and then the Nyhart people are just off in their own corner. Um, <laughs> don't even bring up Wright Morris. So her depictions of, of, of turn of the century Nebraska and its people are, are considered classics. All of her texts are still in print, okay, which is an amazing for a female author of, of her generation. None of her writing has ever gone out of Okay. Um, widely available, um, many of it now out of copyright. There have been terrible films made of her. She hated <laughs> film um, depictions of her work and refused during her lifetime to make any more after Barbara Stanswick ruined it. Um, but part of her allure and why we're all here and why you've probably all read it is, is her reimagining of Nebraska places and people in her fiction. Every novel is read aloud. Every story are her neighbors, it's the immigrants that she grew up with, it's depictions of the divide, uh, the, the area of, of Webster County that she moved to when she came to Nebraska from Virginia. And so we know that, that she's intimately bound up with Red Cloud, and to a lesser extent, Lincoln, where she graduated from, from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln in 1895. And, and one of the items I have over here is, is actually the program from her graduation in 1895. Um, and these places oriented her. Uh, the, the, the counter scholar, scholar Daryl Palmer says the red cloud was always the compass rose for her. Yeah, if, if, and this is partially what, what I'm interested in is the other places that inspired her, the other places that she came to, right? There's a lot of Nebraska outside red cloud. Red cloud's also not that much of Nebraska, sorry. Um, and I wanna look at the, the confluences and connections that she has in other parts of the state. And so I was just kind of curious. Um, and, and directed to, well, what, what was Catherine's relationship with Carney? Did she ever come to Carney? Did she write about Carney? Did she know anybody in Carney? Um, and as, as Catherine well understood, you know, Nebraska is not monolithic. It varies county to county, town to town, section to section, quarter to quarter. Um, and, and Nebraska places and people beyond Red Cloud shaped her life in very intimate ways, as we're going to see. And so we're going to look at these, these little known connections between Cather and Carney. By no means are we the Red Cloud or the Lincoln um, or even the Wilbur in her um, <laughs> connection. She did spend time at Wilbur um, of this story. But, you know, we're, we're 70 odd miles northwest of Red Cloud. We're not far. Okay. Um, 
And so it's it's distanced enough that she was not an irregular visitor. We're not off the beaten path by any means. Um, and she came to visit family and friends in the city twice. Also, some of the most influential non-family members in her life were associated with Carney. And so, as, as I mentioned, you know, these connections, it, it's no surprise, you know, that she has connections to the community. We're one of the, one of the dominant communities in the state, you know, a center of culture. Um, and before we kind of get in there, though, you know, for those of you who haven't read anything about Willa or, or haven't read any Willa, um, she's originally from Virginia, and there's currently an ongoing effort to actually preserve her family home in Virginia. Um, the, the National Willa Catholic Center is leading that fundraising effort. It's, it's, it's kind of a ramshackle, rundown home in rural Virginia. Uh, but the family moves to Nebraska in 1883. And they, they initially live on the Divide in northwestern Webster County. Um, but they don't do well out there, and so they, come, they move into town um, very, very soon. And, and she's a very precocious young woman. Um, everybody in town knows her, and it, this, is, this is in her fiction. She's interning with the local doctor. She's, she's cutting her hair and going by William. She's um, conducting autopsies on local animals because she wants to become a doctor. Um, th there's a lot to Willa. Um, and she eventually goes to UNL where she graduates in 1895, and, and it becomes a, a, a very influential period of her life. She becomes the um, theater critic for, for the local paper. She begins publishing her fiction, and she meets a lot of friends who, who greatly uh, shape her fiction. And we're actually going to see a couple of them um, reappear here later in her life. Um, but then she moves east. She first she first goes to Philadelphia or to, to Pittsburgh, excuse me. Um, gets a job there, uh, becomes the editor of, of the Home Monthly, and then eventually makes her way to New York. Um, and in New York, she lives with with Edith Lewis, her her, her partner of thirty nine years, who's also from Nebraska. Edith Edith is actually from Lincoln, um, younger than Willa, and, and attends Smith College. And, and they're introduced, um, and then spend the rest of their lives together. They're buried under the same tombstone in Jaffrey, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. um, because Willa is not buried in Nebraska. Um, in 1923, she's awarded the Pulitzer Prize for one of ours, which is her, her um, homage and, and her uh, commemoration of her cousin, uh, G.P. Cather, who, who dies in the First World War. Um, and then in 1947, she, she dies in New York City um, and, and is buried in Jaffrey, New Hampshire. She's buried in the town cemetery, actually, kind of this old colonial cemetery. And in Jaffrey, she spends a lot of time um, there we actually have one of the items here is, is a letter from the Shattuck Inn where she spends a lot of time, where she writes my Antonia in a tent in front of uh, the mountains. Um, you know, she's, she's writing all of this in the East Coast. She's not writing anything around here. Um, and that first connection to Carney is actually Edith. Um, this, is, this is a picture of Edith on one of their many, many trips into the Southwest. Um, and, and Edith lived in Kearney in the 1890s, actually. So her father was, was, was a prominent a uh, banker and an official in, in um, Lincoln. And due to the Panic of 1893, a lot of banks failed. Mm -hmm. And so he became the receiver for a number of banks in the area. And so they actually moved the family here in 1895 and they lived here through 1896. And she attended Carney High. She was in the orchestra, she's in, she's in the paper, um, kind of discussing her musical prowess. Um, and, and she, by all accounts, enjoys her time here in the city. Um, so much so that she actually does uh, come back and visit later um, in, in 1897. Um, and her father maintains that connection to the community. He actually is one of the early investors in the irrigation canal in Elmcrick. And he, come, he keeps coming back and, and investing in um, a lot of local improvement efforts in the area, much to the chagrin of the Lewis family once they moved back to Lincoln. He spends a lot of time out here. Um, and they would really like him to refocus on businesses in Lincoln um, and not spend any time in the dirt in Elmcrick. Um, and so this is, for example, this is from the Hub in 1897, where, where, where she comes back to have um, the prize was won by Miss Edith Lewis. The remainder of the evening was spent playing duplicate whist, and between the originals and duplicate, the luncheon was served. The invited guests were Miss Edith Lewis of Lincoln and then and others. So she and, and her brothers were still coming back to town in 1897. And, and whether Willa and, and Edith talked about, you know, kind of her years in Carney is unclear. Because um, they were very rarely apart. There's not that many letters between them. Neither of them kept a diary, um, which, which is part of the, the difficulty in, in kind of knowing just how their household functioned. Um, but there were other figures, you know, very, very soon. Um, and one of those connections very early is Bishop George Allen Beecher. So Bishop Beecher is going to be one of the most influential kind of figures in Catholic spiritual life. 
Um, Bishop Beecher is, is her spiritual mentor. Um, Bishop Beecher is the one who confirms her into the Episcopal Church in 1922. And Bishop Beecher is, is raised in Kearney, and, and as we'll see, he remains in Kearney. He's still in the Kearney Cemetery. Um, Bishop Beecher had a lot of uh, similarities to Willa. They're, they're, they're uh, approximately the same age. He was born into a devout Baptist family, also like Willa. Um, and, and Beecher and his family had moved from Illinois to, to Nebraska. And uh, while Beecher was at UNL, his, his father died. And so he moves back home, he leaves Lincoln, he comes back to Kearney, um, and he continues his education under tutelage of, of the Reverend um, Robert Oliver, who is an Episcopal priest. He's the founding Episcopal priest of what was then Good Shepherd is now St. Luke's Episcopal Church. Um, and uh, Robert Oliver is also the founding chancellor of KU. That was his career before he came to Kearney. He founded the University of Kansas. Um, quite an accomplishment, but when he was the chancellor, there were no buildings and no faculty and no students because <laughs> Lawrence had been burned down. Um, kind of a difficult position. And so when his father, when, when, Beecher, when, when Beecher's father passes away in 1889, um, he, he is by his own admittance a, a quote, stranded youth. And it's through the Reverend Oliver that he, and he later writes this in his memoir, he became a father to me when I was fatherless. And this support from Reverend Oliver ultimately leads um, Bishop Beecher to, to take holy orders, and he becomes an Episcopal priest himself. Um, he was confirmed at St. Luke's Episcopal Church, with, with the Good Shepherd, what is now St. Luke's. His ordinations to the deaconate and priesthood happened at St. Luke's. Um, for those of you, and I know there are a number of St. Luke's parishioners in the audience, uh, it was it's it's the altar that's now in the Bishop's Chapel, which is named after Reverend Oliver, where all of these things happened. Um, and he also courted his wife there, a young uh, Florence George. And he later wrote to her, all the experiences of our courtship were centered there. And as there, we made plans together for our future. And they planned a future in Kearney. But they also understood that, that Kearney has many of the features of a small town. Um, and become a Upon becoming a priest, Beecher served for 11 years um, as a pastor in Sydney. Um, he was actually also the chaplain for Fort Sydney at the time. And then North Platte, where he befriended the most, his most famous parishioner in North Platte. And in 1905, he went on the Wild West show with Buffalo Bill. <laughs> um, and repeatedly during this time, the, 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 the Episcopalians of Carney were like, can you please come back? And, and sent increasingly you know, uh, letters imploring him love you to have come back. We, we hear great things out west. You should come back to Carney. Um, and he does in 1903. He finally comes back and lasts a year. <laughs> He's only here for a year. And in, in his memoir, he talks about his brief rectorship of, of St. Luke's with a reflection on laboring in one's hometown, which is which is something that I think he and Willow would relate to. He said, quote, somehow it seems unnatural for a man to be called to any responsible public position in the old town where he lived as a boy. <laughs> slightly ironic for me saying that, but um, when the couple returned to Kearney, Beecher realized that well, it was in many specs, respects a period of transition, the city was changing, and his ministry was taking him farther afield from his parish duties. And so he, he went and he, he eventually got a job at, at the cathedral at, at Holy Trinity in, in Omaha. But then he, in uh, 1910, he becomes the bishop of the Western Missionary District. So St. Luke's Episcopal Church was very briefly a cathedral. Um, and he was the bishop there in 1910. And after a year, he moves it to Hastings. Mm -hmm. Reportedly, the kind of the, the church lore is that uh, Mrs. Beecher didn't get along with the local community, um, <laughs> and so they moved they moved the parish to to the Pro Cathedral, what is now the Pro Cathedral in Hastings. And while there, when he moved the seat to Hastings, his duties included occasionally preaching at Grace Church in Red Cloud. And it was there in, in December or in, in 1922 that he confirmed Willa Cather and her parents in the Episcopal Church. <laughs> and it was also where, in 1947, he presided over the memorial service for Willa after she died. <laughs> now, her funeral was not in Red Cloud, but, but many, many members of her family, the local community, and others were there. Um, he was a frequent visitor to the parish in Red Cloud, so much so that Cather would rightly declare that, quote, he has shared so many joys and sorrows with us there, that he has become a part of the life of the town, quite as if he lived there always. Hmm. And this is a letter that, that uh, Will actually writes in, in 1935 on the anniversary, 25th anniversary of his, his service as a bishop. 
And part of my research into this is actually kind of expanding their relationship. They knew each other since at least 1920, so two years before she was actually confirmed. Um, Bishop Beecher is often doing other family functions, weddings, baptisms, uh, funerals, um, and she would frequently visit him um, when she was passing through town because to get the train to Red Cloud, you have to stop at Hastings. And so she would just walk from the depot, where it's still there today, just the what two blocks of the Pro Cathedral, and go see the bishop and his mm -hmm. wife. He would also visit her in New York City when he was in town. And so they have a very, very, um, you know, rich relationship. They, they correspond from, from 1920 until she passes away. Um, so for the next 25 years. Um, and, and Bishop Beecher becomes a preacher, but doesn't spend his time in Carney, but he, he remains with us today. He is, he is still here. Um, you can go and see Bishop Beecher in the Carney Cemetery. And, and he, he lays a connection then to the next figure, the next influential figure that we're going to see in Willow's life. And, and thunder and rain and hail did not temper the laying of the cornerstone for the, the state normal school in October 1904. So think about that. UNK was, was, was the cornerstone was laid in a, in a hailstorm. Very <laughs> Nebraska. Um, yeah. And they actually stopped the ceremony halfway through, went to the opera house, and then, and then went back when the storm ended. <laughs> Now, undeterred, the ceremony continued, though, when, when, when after the hailstorm, and, and Beecher was the chapel at the laying of the cornerstone at the administration building at uh, what is now the University of Nebraska, Kearney. And, and presumably, he led the damp crowd in an invocation praying for the school's future success. And this was during his very brief rectorship at, at St. Luke's, but, but they left very, very quickly, and the new staff for the normal school came on board. And among those was a young woman from Red Cloud, well, middle-aged woman from Red Cloud, by the name of, of Eva J. Hayes. Wilda Cather, in her own account, and I have it here, considered Eva J. Hayes to be, quote, the first person who I ever cared a great deal for outside my own family. And this is a statement she, she gives distanced the commencement address to the graduating class of Red Cloud in 1909. She writes a letter that then is read in the Opera House in Red Cloud, talking about her time in Red Cloud and particularly the educators who made her who she is. And that woman is Eva J. Case. Now, it's a sentiment she disclosed to others. She told her partner, Edith Lewis, who then recounted it in her memoir of, of Willa, Willa Cather Living, that, that uh, Kate, she considered Case the, quote, very unusual teachers who first taught Cather to think, first helped her find her way in the world of imaginative thought, and that she owned, owed to them the early ideals of scholarship and art that gave her direction in her own life. Mm -hmm. To the first students, though, of the Nebraska State Normal College, now University of Nebraska Kearney, quote, she commanded the love and admiration of the student body. And Case had been an educator her whole life. Um, she, she started as an elementary teacher and then was later the Webster County superintendent. And then eventually becomes the superintendent of, of schools in Red Cloud proper. And it was when she was the Red Cloud superintendent um, that she then becomes the preceptress in September 1905 of the Nebraska State Normal School. She runs the first dorm mm -hmm. on campus. Um, she was in charge of this dormitory, Green Terrace, which I'm sure some of you might remember as kind of being a roach-infested building um, now where um, Antelope Hall is. And she remained at the Normal School until her death in 1907. And Cather would always remember her and enshrined her both in the, the 1909 uh, graduation address that she gives to the students at Red Cloud and then in her final short story, The Best Years, which is a remembrance of Eva Case. The last thing she ever published in 1945, last thing she ever completed, was a short story about this woman. And in that former story, Cather shared that then, just so you get a sense too, this is Green Terrace. Uh, those of you who remember, this this was the first. It was it was built as a, as a hotel, um, and then was part of the deal to bring the normal school here. It's like, oh, well, we already have a dorm. It's great. Um, it was not. Um, it was built. It was built by the Frank family. It, it kind of has the same architectural style, the the, the kind of neo the Italian Romanesque of, of the um, G.W. Frank Museum, um, and it's here that that Eva Case would spend her her last years. And it's in the former story, um, in, in the best years, that Cather shared that Eva King, later Case, 
or actually, sorry, it's, it's, in, it's in the 1909 address, that Case interviewed her when she enrolled in school, fresh off the divide. So when the town comes in, when, when the Cathars come in from, from rural Webster County into Red Cloud, the first educator she meets is Eva Case, young girl, going into the uh, first grade. And in Cathars' second year, King became her teacher and her principal at South Ward School. Cather, by her own admission, realized that, quote, she wanted more than anything in the world to please her, end quote, and strove to make King happy and was inspired by her to overcome any mistakes. Quote, I am very sure that Miss King was the first person whom I ever cared a great deal for for outside my family. When Cather, or when Case became the Webster County Superintendent, she continued to mentor and tutor Willa in her free time, all the way through high school. And midway through her time in Lincoln, um, Cather kind of reestablished a relationship with, with Case, who at this point in time um, had become king. She had married a, a local attorney, um, O.C. Case, and, quote, learned to care for him almost as much as for his wife, end quote. Now, her public sentiments in 1909 were, were shaped by the celebratory nature of, of the occasion and the Case's absence. Eva Case, um, who, this is, this is an early... Um, this is actually the, the first group of faculty um, at the university. You can you can see the, the mild danger of dangling over the second story <laughs> for a good photo. Um, this is also this is a Solomon Butcher photo, also another kind of notable figure. And um, the woman in the over the top hat, um, standing behind um, uh, A.O. Thomas, the, the first president of the university, actually, yeah, um, is is that the case? Mm -hmm. And O.C. Case died in 1904 and Eva Case died in 1907. And so this address, this, this speech that, that she sends to Red Cloud in 1909 is, is functionally a eulogy for, for Case. And, and when we think about the gravity of the statement that the Case was the first person I cared about outside my family, like that's, that's something that she's been carrying with her, right? That, that's quite a weighty statement to make. And, and, and the statement's a publicly declared. Okay. It explains in part why Eva Case was then reimagined as Evangeline Kingsley in the best years of 1945. Um, when, when Case resigned as, as city superintendent in 1905, she, she comes and she works. And it's a really difficult time in her life when she arrives. Her, her brother commits suicide shortly before um, she arrives in Kearney, and it's all over the Webster County paper. Um, and it, it echoes what, what that happens in the best years, where um, she's, she's at a case is on a train and here's the news that, that her favorite teacher has died while she's been out of town, which is exactly what happened to Eva Case. She was out of town, is on the train and hears that her brother has, has killed himself. Mm -hmm. um, as, the, as the preceptor's case was, was considered a wise counselor of the young ladies of the school, according to the very first yearbook, which is dedicated to her, <laughs> Um, Case suffered from frequent bouts of illness during her uh, the fall and spring semester of 1907. And, and by the fall, she was too ill to work. And she was initially nursed in her home, but eventually was moved into what would become her deathbed at A.O. Thomas's house, mm -hmm. which is the alumni house now. Um, as as you, you can see, the neighborhood has changed a little bit. Um, and the house also, which is, which is now white, right, was originally gray. Um, uh, uh, A.O. Thomas had had uh, quite a bit invested in a local uh, stone and concrete company, um, <laughs> which is why the house is made out of concrete bricks. It's also uh, the company that made the first administration building on campus. No connection between that one. Um, and she was transferred then to Omaha's Presbyterian Hospital, where they immediately took her into surgery and discovered advanced liver cancer. And she died on the table. Which then was was reported in in the local press. They initially thought it was gallstones, and then advanced and discovered discovered the cancer. And and the sudden death greatly impacted the the student body. The the, the student body passed a resolution um, talking about her as, as a wise and grieving and loving counselor, and echoing this, the, the normal board of education um, released a statement reflecting on her her kind deeds and wise labor. And as I mentioned, the first yearbook. Um, for what's now UNK is dedicated to her. And there are statements throughout. And, and, and also, I, I do have to commend 
thanks to the effort of, of, of the late Phil Holmgren, all of all of the resolutions, all the faculty minutes about this actually do survive mm -hmm. as well. And in her story, The Best Years, Evangeline Thorndike Kingsley comes back to what is functionally Red Cloud alive, which is something that the Eva case never, never got to do. And she goes to visit the grave of, of a young teacher that, that she had inspired and mentored. And she brings with her flowers from her own garden. And she lays flowers on the grave of, of this teacher. And, and, and Cather then provides Eva the, the living homecoming that she never received in life. Because Eva, Eva never went back to Red Cloud alive. And she, she, she remains in Red Cloud. She is buried. It was brought from Omaha to Red Cloud and, and buried beside her husband's. And, and much of the faculty actually attended. K.O. Thomas attended, Anna Caldwell, and Anna Brown. Um, on the university's dime. <laughs> that also survives. <laughs> and although Case was only at the normal school for two years, her, her legacy was cherished by the students well after she was gone. So much so that 23 years later, um, oh, this is this is the memoriam statement, and then this is the student body resolution, which, mm -hmm. which both survived. And they had a memorial service at um, the chapel which was in the administration building at the time um, and and read they had they they read a prayer they, they performed some um different different music and, and different addresses were were read um and this is this is the description that that willa gives us of, of a case which by all account it matches everything the student body says they really truly love this woman um and this is something that Willa is writing in 1945, well after she had been a student of this woman in the 1880s, 60 years later. This is what she thinks about. And there's an anecdote that, that Willa shares that when she comes out of college and she moves to Red Cloud, she doesn't know what she's going to do in life. And she's sitting at, at the case house. And Eva tells her, you're too big for Red Cloud. You need to get out. <laughs> And she does mm. right so if, if and, and it's all hypothetical but if that advice hadn't been shared will it could have just been somebody in red cloud not will it happen but they remembered her and cherished her so, so much that 23 years later the nebraska state teachers college named its first purpose-built women's dorm at the case hall she was only at the school for two years. <laughs> and yet, two decades later, they remembered her impact that much that they named the whole building after her, which went down in 2006. Thankfully, thanks to UNK facilities, um, the sign of a JK's Hall does survive. The decorative features of, of the building do survive. Um, and as we're going to see, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually fairly curious of Will I ever uh, saw this building or when? It's mm -hmm. one of the things I, I'd speculate. But, um, so she had these connections, these mentors, her spiritual mentor, her, her you know, educational mentor, the teacher that inspired her to, to be who she is, deeply tied to her. But she also had family. This is, this is Ethel and Jim Cather. This is her younger brother and her sister-in-law. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and Jim Cather, who she was not particularly close to by any means, um, lived in Kearney from 1924 until 1934. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, just barely by, by a couple of weeks, a decade. And even though she wasn't particularly close to Jim and she and Ethel didn't always get along, um, their children, Helen Louise and Charles Cather, both became Willa's literary executors after Edith Lewis passed away. Mm -hmm. And so they controlled her legacy, and it's ultimately her, her nephew, um, Charles, who, who um, is the one who authorizes the um, opening of her letters and making all of her stuff accessible to the wider public, breaking the, the, the trust that um, Willa had set up when she died. <laughs> and in 1934, that they moved to California, but it's these 10 years, and it's, it's, it's unfortunate. They, they themselves, neither, neither uh, Charles nor, nor Helen, Really leave us a lot about their time in Carney. Uh, so I've, I've been piecing this together through a variety of other other means. But but they lived in a small house at, at 106 East 27th Street. So so over by Good Samaritan Hospital. Um, so I apologize 
to whoever lives in that house now because I think I sent more people to drive very slowly by that house, um, which is unfortunate. Um, and, and Jim Cather was a salesman at the Hugo Johnson Company, a clothing company, which was downtown. Um, a position that actually precipitated their move to Red Cloud. The announcement that they had hired him appears in the Carney Hub. Um, he's, he's identified as, a, as, a, as an exceptional salesman in the clothing business. And everybody in town at this point, right, they moved to Kearney in 1924. Willow wins a Peeled Surprise in 23. Everybody kind of knows the Catherine name at this point. She's she's not just some obscure poet or you know novelist at this point. It's it's far more than Alexander's Bridge that has come out um, at this point. This is, my Antony has come out. It's er, uh, Oak Pioneers has come out. Um, and this made something of Ethel an authority in the local community. And so she was the member and, and later president of the Carney Delphinian Society, which was a women's literary organization. Um, an educational organization, and in 1929, they had a Willa Cather party. Okay. Um, by special request, Miss J.D. Cather's visit, or Cather's, um, uh, she read some of the passages from Death Comes for the Archbishop. So you can't have the real author here, but you can have her sister-in-law read her stuff. <laughs> like, it's, it's, you know. Now, the wonderful thing about this, though, and this is thanks to the Buffalo County Historical Society. Wow. The Delphinian records actually survived, of all things, as a, as a women's educational organization from the 1920s and 30s. And they're the, the leather books sitting here over on the edge of the table. Um, and we have the minutes done in Ethel Cather's handwriting of the meetings, the Ethel Cather Secretary Pro Tem, of all of the events going on. Um, and so she, she's very involved in kind of the local um, literary community. And because the Cathars were here. Willis stopped and visited. Um, and Cather stopped in Carney at least twice. And she really enjoyed spending time with this part of her family. Um, again, she had issues with 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 her, wasn't really close to, to Jim and was kind of standoffish with Ethel. But Helen, the young woman here, she really treasured this niece and nephew. Um, loved spending time with them, loved writing to them, loved, you know, she would write postcards from France, she would send them little gifts, um, all sorts of different things. Um, and, and this is well documented within, within Cather Scholarship. For generations, people would, would track down. Helen became kind of an uh, important figure in Will Cather Scholarship, and people would, would turn to her for information about her aunt. Mm -hmm. And so it's in, in June of 1927 that Helen Louise, then living in Kearney, went with Will on a two-week trip to Wyoming. Um, to visit uh, Roscoe Cather, who's, who's her, another brother, as well as, quote, to, to flee the noise and confusion of the, the construction work that's going on in her apartment in New York City. <laughs> and when I said that this is, you know, difficult to kind of piece together, there is a notice in the hub about the trip that appears two weeks after they get back, saying that they're about to go on the trip. Um, <laughs> not always on top of things, you know. Um, but where we actually have the evidence for this trip happening, there's there's some there's there's some in, in some of Cather's correspondence. We know she's visiting Roscoe in this time period, but but kind of Helen Louise's perspective, it's in her baby book, which survives at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. So of all things, you know, again, this is what the historian has to do. You have to use a baby book. Um, to piece together, <laughs> piece together these things. Um, and, and, and we don't really know much about beyond that she kind of stops and picks up her niece and then, and then goes up to Wyoming. But shortly after they get back, um, Willa's father has a heart attack. Um, and, and she does likely visit Carney at some point during this time just to deal with family issues. We're, we're short train right away. Um, and so th there's some circumstantial evidence that, that she comes. Um, and although we don't know when exactly she came, um, the time she spent with them influenced her, her, her work um, during this time period. And we do have a lot of other kinds of linkages to Carney. Um, she writes a lot of letters. This is a letter to Ethel in, in Willa's very distinctive handwriting, which I can attest, as, as you can see at the table, um, is infuriatingly difficult to read um, on occasion. Oh, and so she would send she would send postcards. This is from Paris um, to Carnegie, Nebraska, 106 East, 27th Street, Charles. Yeah. 
And no, this is this is her with Helen in 1924. Hmm. So again, very very close um, throughout their life. Um, and then and then they would go that Christmas in 1927. They would they would all have a family Christmas in in, in Red Cloud. Um, and it's during this Christmas in 1927 that her nephew Charles from Carney um, he wants to put a little plastic cow in the nativity. <laughs> um, he doesn't really know any better and. Willa just adores this. Um, and, and we're going to see that this, where this kind of plays back out in Shadows on the Rock. Um, in 1931, she comes back. And this, talk, this visit is actually very well documented when she comes to town in 1931. Um, it's, it's much shorter. It's just an overnight visit. And this is a very difficult time in her life. Her father has passed away. Her mother is in a sanatorium in California. And she's living back east. And so she's on transcontinental trains, almost seemingly weekly, moving between California and New York and, and just trying to, to manage everything. Um, and um, a lot of her friends kind of write about 1931 as being very difficult. A, a division of, of, of her labors and, and her, her inner powers is, is uh, Elizabeth Shepley Sargent would remember. Um, and, and Edith would say that the year 1931 was a very hard one. It took something permanently from her vital force because her mother is going to end up dying um, soon. But she arrived on, on the, the eastbound train on June 1st um, and left the following afternoon. She stayed with her family at, at 106 West, as far as we can tell. But in a small town, everybody almost knew immediately that Willa Cather got off the train. Um, and this, this has made it in the hub. Um, rumor of her presence was soon spread, quote, she refused to see anyone else during her short stay, wishing to devote her whole time to her brother and family, and quote, reported, reported the Carney Hub. And although everybody kind of made, was aware that she was in town, it got very quickly overshadowed. Because that afternoon, Amelia Earhart landed at the air. At the air. <laughs> so like, you know, Willa at this point, she, she's won a Pulitzer, she's, she's very, very famous. She's a writer, but Amelia Earhart landed at the airfield <laughs> in an auto gyro. Um, and and as, the, as the hub talks about, she just kind of, she gets out of the auto gyro. She, she's making a, a transcontinental trip. She falls back and lays in the wheat. Um, it's, it's next to the airfield. Um, and then they pass around the check at the city council meeting that night because she had to pay for gas. Um, and it's unclear, it's even in the newspaper, somebody pocketed it. Um, so someone in town has a signed receipt for, you know, like 25 gallons of, um, you know, aviation fuel signed by Amelia Era when she came, came through town. Um, and, and this made so much of a, of a, of a splash that it then is reported in like all the paper that Willa Catherine and Amelia Earhart were here the same day. They didn't meet each other. They had really nothing to do together besides being exceptional women, um, but they were here. So Willa very quickly was able to kind of like hide because everybody was more interested in that. Um, and she comes because Helen is, is having a dance recital. She's a student at Emerson at this time period. And they're doing, they're having, you know, kind of end of the year, um, different types of performances, um, and somehow, and it's likely because Ethel is a, is a local club woman, she convinces Willa to go to a breakfast the following day at the Fort Carney Hotel. Um, and this is very much, Willa does not want to talk to anybody, Willa does not want to be seen, you know, and so her sister-in-law is like, no, you should really come, everybody will really like you either. I can brag to all my friends that you can. And so she attends this breakfast. Um, is presumably as her sister's guest. And, and the Carney Weekly Tribune actually gives a full account of this visit. Um, and she actually then is kind of put on the spot and asked to make a statement. So she kind of stands up in the back of the ballroom and like, okay, I'll say something. Mm -hmm. And says, I hope you really are enjoying life. You take time to enjoy life and do the things you like. It takes courage to be simple and sincere. In pretending liking of false and superficial things, there's no satisfaction. Real happiness is found in liking and being with people with whom you have a common bond of interest in the affairs of your own locality. Hmm. And so the Weekly Tribune gives, gives this, this really deep account um, of, of her trip. And then the Carney Hub reporter, let not quite on the ball, um, goes and finds her later. <laughs> and um, she tells, this is what she tells the Hub, it, it, it's really sad that she, she can't stop and write about and see her friends. Mm -hmm. um, and, and doesn't really say much else. Um, 
And what she, what she says is that while her new novel is coming out, um, she's got to go meet with the French translator in New York, so it's a really sudden trip. Where in actuality, she was, she was headed, headed to New Jersey, she was going to receive an honorary degree from Princeton. And she's the first woman to receive an honorary degree from Princeton, which at this time is an all-men school. Um, and she's receiving it alongside Charles Lindbergh. So she's really close to all these aviators for whatever reason in this very, very short period of time. But, but the notices for this very quickly go out and it is reprinted in the Red Cloud paper. So everybody in Red Cloud knows she's been here but hasn't seen them. <laughs> and so she actually writes a letter to Anna Pavelka, the inspiration for, for my senior. She actually writes a, a letter to their sons apologizing that she, she couldn't stop. And that does, does survive. Now, she does hurry through town um, this is the visit, this is at the Fort Carney Hotel, um, where she's, she attends to, to this event, and this is what the, the Weekly Tribune tells us, that she's coming to see her little niece dance. Um, but she almost misses the train and gives this account, she, she writes it then, I had a bad time in my heart ever since I had to make, uh, I had to make that run for the train in Carney and the heat and fatigue bringing up palpitations that is dangerous. So she has heart palpitations for the rest of 1931 that she traces back to running for the train in Carney. So I want you all to imagine this because the train depot, right, is where the Union Pacific building is now, which is, you know, 600 feet maybe from where we're standing right now. Imagine the, the westbound express is, is, or eastbound express is pulling out and Willa's there with a, with a suitcase trying to run <laughs> to catch that train. Um, not, not the most dignified exit to Carney, <laughs> but um, it really does, does influence her nevertheless. And this also very thankfully does survive. Um, and it's this time that she spends here, here she is with all her nieces and nephews oh, wow. in Red Cloud in the family home. And it's, it's during these Christmases in, in 1927 in particular that Charles, and it's not for the first that Charles wanted his toy cow included in the nativity scene. And quote, Willa hesitated, not wishing to deprive him of his treasure, but he insisted on giving it to the little Jesus. And she reimagines this in her next novel, Shadows on the Rock. Um, in Shadows on the Rock, which um, we have, there's a signed copy of the French edition by her French translator over here on the table. Um, I have a surprise for you that this young boy, Jacques, who's the, the son of a sex worker in, in colonial Quebec, um, is kind of partially adopted by the, the young pharmacist's family who's, who's at the center of the story. Um, and his most treasured item is a, is a carved wooden beaver that one of her mother's clients gives him. And he puts it in the nativity says, um, oh, Jacques, how nice of you. I don't believe there's ever been a beaver in a crèche before. <laughs> but she noticed that Jacques was content standing beside the crèche like a sentinel, playing no need to the pigeon children or anyone else quite lost in the satisfaction of seeing his beaver placed in a scene so radiant. And this is this episode. She later would actually tell Dorothy Campbell Fisher, who, who was the daughter of the regent of UNL at the time when she was there. And they kind of hung out, even though Dorothy Campbell Fisher was significantly younger. Um, that this was exactly that Christmas hmm. in 1927 when she watched um, the, um, she writes later um, to Dorothy Canfield Fisher, Jacques is a little nephew I love the best. I stopped in Nebraska to see him for a day last week. I said, Mr. Carney, he's just the same, remembers everything we did together. Yeah. And so we see Carney in a way, or at least the people in Carney in her fiction. Small episodes, I iconic episodes. This is one of the most moving episodes of, of Shadows on the Rock. Um, and so when we think of Willow, you know, Carney is really easy to overlook in her life, right? She only visits here twice, but the people who, who are in this work do reflect in her life and in her fiction. And she very well understands this area. And so, in Lucy Gayhart, which is one of her criminally underread novels, which is set along the fire River, She does have this statement, which I want to leave you with. Um, There's no air like the Platte Valley. It's never too high, Chicago's too low. There's no autumns like ours anywhere. She knew this area, right? She knew these people. She had a deep connection to where we are now. So now I do 
slight addendum. I'm a historian. I like appendixes. Mm -hmm. So I did bring, <laughs> we will do questions, but I did bring cather traders. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so I collect catheralia. Um, and among the things that, that is here is, is, is her, her commencement program from 19, 1895. Um, where she graduates, you can see, um, I've underlined so you can see here, here's Willa. And then receiving her MA is, is Louise Pound, who, who was largely assumed to kind of be her first love um, and, and first heartbreak, um, and who, who she later becomes a professor at, at UNL. And Pound Hall is named after her and her brother Roscoe, who, who becomes the dean of Harvard Law. Um, and so there's a lot of, uh, as well as, as you can see, her handwriting. Um, <laughs> there is one capital letter sitting on the table. Um, and, and after one of ours comes out, um, she gets a lot of letters from from mothers and World War One veterans, mm -hmm. um, talking about the depictions um, of of everything. And this is the Shattuckin in Jeffrey, New Hampshire, where she's buried and where she writes um, all of her most famous work. Um, and it's about Claude, the main character, with a boy I knew well. It's, it's modeled on her, her cousin, or I think he had many brothers in the Prairie States. Yours truly. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a, a telegram from her. This is later in life, this is 1945. Um, to S.R. Florence, who was, who was a, a businessman in Red Cloud, and he managed her affairs um, in Red Cloud. Um, she still owned land, had other, other different things. And, and um, people don't know what their rare book dealers don't know what they have. Um, uh, this, is, this is a copy of her editor's memoir. Ferris Greenslet, who was who's her longtime editor at, at Helen Mifflin. Um, and this is Willa's copy of her memoir, of his memoir. And it's got all her annotations in it. Um, so she's a very, very active reader. There's a lot of pencil markings on different things, even the parts where she's mentioned, right, in the book. Um, and it's 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 to Willa. This came out of her library at some point. Um, and then to kind of give you an indication of, of her relationship with, with Edith, this is a letter to also to S.R. Florence, um, giving him permission to talk to an early scholar, E.K. Brown, who's, who's Cather's first biographer. Um, and she's writing, she says, you have my permission to talk to him when he comes to Red Cloud. And so she's functioning both as a, as, a, as, a, as a wife and as a literary executor. They're like, I'm gonna let you talk about Willa. I, I give you my permission um, to do that. Being compared by the biography of Willis being compared by E.K. Brown of, of the University of Chicago. And that's sure her handwriting is so much better than Willis. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah. much better. Um, and then also a, a, a signed copy of, of Shadows on the Rock, which is which is the novel that was with us the most today, and this is signed by the, the French translator. Um, and then the the other edition. This is this is a recent edition of my collection. Um, this is a, a armed services edition of, of Death Comes for the Archbishop, um, and they printed these up for soldiers in the Second World War. Hmm. And you can tell um, they're they're made so they can slip in a back pocket or in a in a, in a bag or, or what have you. Um, and they printed Death Comes for the Archbishop for the D-Day invasion. Hmm. Totally makes sense when you're on a Higgins boat about to hit a beach that you want to read about. <laughs> French Jesuits in 19th century in Mexico. Yeah. Like that's really gonna, and there's there's a great quote in the Saturday Evening Post of one of these soldiers who got one of these, and he thought it was like a like a hard-boiled fiction, like like the archbishop is gonna get killed by like an assassin or something. And uh, it's like, I, I read it, it was fine. <laughs> um, it wasn't what I thought it was. Um, but as you can imagine, these things don't survive, right? You're on a Higgins boat, um, you're in the, the um, you know, hedgerows of Normandy, um, you know, preserving and keeping, again, a deep biographical study of two French Jesuits in 19th century <laughs> Mexico. Not your highest priority. Um, so that's also there. And, and then, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, Lori Potter has, has brought a replica of the statue um, of Willa Cather uh, that was created by a, a professor at, at Creighton University that is going to be going in the U.S. Statuary Hall of Fame. So the state of Nebraska had, had voted to remove the previous statues of one Jennings Bryan and Jay Sterling Martin and put uh, Standing Bear and then Will Cather. And it's gonna be the first statue by an African-American sculptor in the Statuary Hall of Fame. Um, it's a beautiful statue, it'll be going in later this year. Um, so Will is still very much with us. Um, 
We are celebrating her 150th birthday this year. Um, she's born in December of 1873. Um, and just the coincidence of all of this, Kearney was also incorporated as a first class city in December of 1873. That's why we're celebrating the 150th anniversary of Kearney. So now I will take questions. <laughs> and also if you want to come up and see stuff, but, but questions first. Sorry, I got time issue. <laughs> Questions? Yes. This is a little question. You underlined, do you feel that denigrated the quality of your collection? Oh, this? Where you underlined in the. In the <laughs> oh, no, I put that in. That, that's digital. Oh, oh that's yeah, it's not. Oh. It's not. It's not. No. No. Oh, no. 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 But the cool thing, though, as a historian, and you can see it better in this. Um, it's all folded up and, and, and dirty, and so you can, it, you can tell it was in somebody's pocket. Like they were sitting at commencement in 1895, they were probably bored. I mean, I know we're at commencement season right now, but like whoever they were there for had graduated, they were kind of zoning out, and it was stuffed in their pocket. And so it's dirty, it's folded, you know, and it gives you that just a little extra patina. Of, uh, yeah, no, I would never, I would never write. No, no. Oh, no, 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 no. No. <laughs> like Willow, a little too much for that. Our son lives in Winchester, Virginia, mm -hmm. and he texts me, and uh, her place where she was born is for sale. He said, you think I should buy this acreage? And the house was lived, there's another house on the place that had been lived in not too long ago, but it has re need repair. But they said the group like in Red Cloud have too much going on, so they're unable to buy it now. So they're hoping somebody will buy it and donate it or- And that has it. changed within the last couple of weeks. They've led a campaign to actually raise its being sold oh, for $200,000, <laughs> which is really good for a decrepit antebellum wooden house with a historical marker from it. Um, and so they are in the process of doing that um, and restoring it, um, hopefully. Um, but they are also very busy redeveloping a lot of, of, a lot of Red Cloud, but-, but um, Ashley and the rest of the folks down there are really hoping that we can we can save that as well. When did you first become in love with this author? And oh, good question. Sparked. Um. So uh, my mother's family is from New Mexico. Originally, has been there for for a very long time. Um, and so I read Death Comes for the Archbishop and just fell in love. Um, and then doing this particular project, those of you who know Chuck Thief, um, encouraged me, strongly encouraged me. I sent him a random email saying, like, hey, I think Willa came to town. He's like, you need to do something with that. And this is <laughs> spiraled into a lot of things. Um, but yeah, but, but really it's, 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 it's her writing and her characters and, and the locale. You, you feel like you know these people when you do it, when you read, like that you, you can identify. And, and there's been a lot of scholarship like specifically to identify people in, in um, Red Cloud, but but you also feel like, oh yeah, no, no, I know somebody in town like that, or I know somebody like that, or, or what have you. It's really, it, it just brings you in. Have you ever come across anything in which she indicated how open she was to editing? Mm. Yeah, so um, Willow was very um, detail oriented. The font size, the binding, the, she refused to have anything put in the paperback during her lifetime, <laughs> except for the service edition. Mm -hmm. um, it's the only thing she ever authorized to put in paperback in her lifetime. Hmm. Um, and editing uh, Melissa Homestead's new biography of, of Willow and Edith, um, and their partnership does kind of talk about how Edith is functioning and like editing a lot of stuff, and contributing to a lot of stuff. Um, and and Ferris, she really respects Ferris um, throughout his life. And and her issue ultimately when she when she switches publishers to Knopf um, in in uh, 2021 is is more about their advertising than their editing. She still communicates with him well after um, her books or she's not publishing with them anymore. Um, and she writes, she sends stuff to Elizabeth Shepley Sargent and kind of other people to kind of take um, 
her stuff back, but she had been an editor. She'd been an editor of McClure's Magazine, um, which was a leading muckraking um, journal in the early 20th century. She'd been the editor at Home Monthly, so she kind of knew, you know, she had she had been the one with the red pen. Um, <laughs> so she kind of knew what it took, but she was she was fairly open to, to some criticism. Okay. <laughs> some. And that's what this is really helpful because again, it's got all of her underlining and, and different things, and so you can kind of get a sense of what she thought about Ferris's remembrances, <laughs> everything. Other questions? It was translated. Her works, some mm -hmm. of her works, were translated into French. Mm -hmm. How about German? How about, of course, no, in the war, probably would be translated into German. No, there's, there's, uh, I mean, not the time, but her stuff's been, she's, she's wildly popular in France. Um, she's um, got a certain following with, with a lot of people she's been translated in, into most major languages. Um, and so, you know, they'll talk about this at Red Cloud. People come from all over. Um, they're, they were, when they were doing remodeling, um, they found a, a postcard that somebody from the UK had slipped into one of the kitchen cabinets in the house, um, talking about how much he, he enjoyed Lilla. Um, and so she, and, and she spends a lot of time, she spends time in France, she <laughs> spends time in Italy, she spends a lot of some time in the UK. Um, so she does have a, a, a wide international presence um, on, on these things. Um, but the French particularly like her, she really likes French authors as well as part of her training. Um, yeah, so you can find her stuff, and 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 even in this time period, her stuff's getting pretty fairly widely translated. There, there's Czech editions, particularly like my Anthony. Um, Anna Pavelka goes on on uh, the Voice of America radio station during the Cold War to talk mm -hmm. to people in, in the Czech and what is then Czechoslovakia in Czech. Mm -hmm. She's on. There's a lovely photo of her sitting at her farm table, talking to the people in, in the Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. um, so so Catherine has a, a very wide reach, well beyond Webster County. That's Where can I access the uh, copy of this? Oh yeah, so um, this is actually in the last issue of the Catherine Review. This whole thing is in, in uh, the Catherine Review, which uh, is freely available online. Or you can become a member of the National World Catherine Foundation and get a subscription. Go down to Red Cloud, buy a copy. <laughs> Otherwise, thank you if you have other questions. And then also just come and look at the stuff. Yeah. And you got you got to see your handwriting. It is infuriating. <laughs> Love her, but